You're listening to the Rethinking Hell podcast, where evangelical Christians discuss what the Bible says about hell and put conventional and controversial views to the test. To continue the discussion and find more resources on this topic, you can visit us online at www.rethinkinghell.com. Hello, and thanks for joining us for another installment of the Rethinking Hell podcast. As you might know by now, my name is Chris Dade, and I'm a contributor here at Rethinking Hell. But unlike several past episodes, I'm not your host today, uh, and neither is Dr. Glenn Peoples, who hosted episode four. No, today it's my pleasure to introduce you to another member of the podcast team, Josh Anderson. And he's joined by Christian philosopher Jeff Cook to discuss Hell and his recent book, Everything New, One Philosopher's Search for a God Worth Believing in. Enjoy the interview. <laughs> Hi, you're listening to the Rethinking Hell podcast, and I'm your host, Joshua Anderson. And today I have with me author and philosopher Jeff Cook. Jeff is, uh, he teaches philosophy at the University of Northern Colorado. Uh, he's also a pastor at Atlas Church there in Greenlee, Colorado. Uh, he's author of a book called Seven, The Deadly Sins and the Beatitudes, and then most recently his newest book, Everything New, One Philosopher's Search, for a God worth believing in. And Jeff, it's great to have you on the show today. Yeah, thanks for having me, Josh. Yeah, I really appreciate it. I have to tell you, you know, I finished your book, uh, reading it last week, and I got to tell you, I really enjoyed it, Jeff. Good. That's good to hear. Yeah, it was excellent. I, I found that your ability to tell stories uh, were all at once both, you know, gripping and very theological. So I, I appreciated the book. Nice. Well, that's what I, yeah, that's what I was shooting for, for sure. I wonder if you can just kind of introduce yourself a little bit here for our listeners. Um, you teach, like I said, philosophy uh, at Colorado. Uh, how did you get into philosophy? Uh, do you have any particular specialization? Or? Yeah, you know what? I minored in philosophy in uh, in undergrad. I have a I have a degree in in literature from UNC, and then uh, I decided I really got into philosophy and, and pursued it in in grad school. So I went to Colorado University. Uh, up in Boulder, studied under uh, Wes Morstan and Michael Tooley, and um, continued. Uh, I just have a master's degree, um, but uh, moved back to Greeley uh, with my family, and we ended up um, starting a church down here right around the same time I started adjuncting for um, the university in our town, for the University of Northern Colorado. And um, so, yeah, so I've been doing that for six years now. And and that's been a that's been a lot of fun. Oh, oh, that's awesome. So, how, how do you like uh, teaching there at the, uh, you know, on the in the university setting? Um, I love it. They, I have uh, this year. I have four intros. Um, so I have 250 s students, and then I'm teaching philosophy or religion with 35 or so students, and it gives me an opportunity to to study stuff I wouldn't normally have time to study. Um, I've learned far more um, teaching than I did in grad school. It kind of pushes you daily to have your stuff solid. Um, and and so it's been a real learning experience for me. Mm. Yeah. And then, you're, of course, you're balancing that, too, with uh, this, you know, your church. Right. Responsibilities as well, too. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. So I do a uh, our church isn't very large, so I mean it's it's a seventy eighty person church. Um, I'm juggling those two balls, so yeah, so so that's been. Uh, but all those all those um, roles, teaching at a church, leading a local community, um, teaching at the the university, and exploring, uh, you know, truth and insight in in philosophical ways, um, getting a chance to write, um, all those really overlap in in that teaching sphere and and that's that's what i really enjoy most so um so i'm a i'm a professional teacher it just expresses itself in a few different places yeah sure i see, I see you have your hand in a, a lot of different things here and i guess you still find time a lot of time to write even these book length projects and i guess the writing is what we really want to talk about here today um before i get to your your book the main book that this interview will focus around is the 
everything new. I wanted to highlight first just a few, you know, other of your little writings that I've seen. You published a piece in New Magazine called Are We Repainting Hell? Uh-huh. And uh, in that article, I see you talk about this concept of staying on the canvas. Uh, right. You talk about an analogy of using a canvas to you know, kind of define the, the boundary lines. You want to just talk about that for a sec? Yeah, I, th- I think that you can imagine really any metaphysical system, um, Christianity being the one that we're discussing, but as a as a canvas that there's certain um, ideas certain big truths that define what you're talking about if you're if you're going to use language to say this this is a metaphysical view and Christianity is a metaphysical view um it seems like you can paint on that canvas you can you can explore things on the canvas um but there are some there's some ideas that move you off the canvas and then you're painting on something else. Mm. You can imagine two sports. Um, baseball and football are both great sports. The the rules for baseball don't apply to football, and the rules for football don't apply to baseball necessarily. Um, so often it's the case, like Christianity, the rules of the sport or the boundaries of the canvas are defined by the creeds. Creeds define orthodoxy. And they establish this is what the metaphysical picture of reality is. And if you and there's all sorts of secondary issues to explore on that canvas. Um, what should we say about abortion? What should we say about, um, you know, the salvation of people who haven't heard of Jesus? Uh, what should we say about um, how we know things and the value of language and um, you know, is, are, are, are there moral absolutes, et cetera. And, and all those things can be explored on the metaphysical, um, canvas of, of Christianity. What cannot be explored and for someone to remain a Christian is to say, well, I wonder if, um, you know, uh, Jesus isn't, isn't at the center of reality. I think it's actually a different personality, mm-hmm. you know, Zeus or Allah or whatever. Um, there, there are moves that could be made in which you move off of, out of orthodoxy and you start playing a different game and those different games might be really valuable. Um, but, but you're no longer a Christian and, and so that's how I would define orthodoxy. Yes. And so applying this to the doctrine of hell, um, yeah. in your view, uh, how do the creeds and this, uh, you know, idea relate to that? Well, it seems to me the creeds say very little about the ontology of hell. They say very little about who goes to hell. I mean, the creeds, the only thing about hell, and it's, and it, and it's, you know, question, questionable if it's even about the hell that's commonly spoken of. It's that Jesus descended into Hades. That's the only thing that comes in the creeds. Mm-hmm. Um, and so how you unpack the idea of Hades then becomes really important you know is hades the grave is hades a, a, a state of eternal conscious torment um that jesus experiences then for for three days and and then moves out of um how does that all work um it seems to me that the 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 creeds though they're very precise on a handful of very important issues when it comes to hell they're they're not as clear and and what that means is that hell is just a secondary issue and it needs to be raised up as a secondary issue and we need to know you know there's some things that are that are essential um to being a christian and there's some things that aren't and and what you think about hell is one of those things that simply is not essential uh, i think you're right I, I really like what you're saying there and i i like the one particular thing you said in the article where you said um that the question being asked by Christians today is not really the question, what if there is no hell? Yeah. Um, but rather, you know, in which hell should we believe? Right. Yep. And that's what, and Rob Bell, you know, in, in the things that happened last year regarding hell, um, has been really consistent on this front that he does, that he believes in hell. And so I thought it was ridiculous that, I mean, Time is, there. the dude who wrote that that article, uh, Meacham, um, Time Magazine ran their cover story was, what if there's no hell? And he, it seems to me that that was a 
publishing era. I mean, Meacham's smart enough to know that's not what the conversation is. The conversation is about how should we interpret this idea, you know, we call hell. Hmm. Um, and that's a great conversation to have. Yeah, I, I think so. And it's playing out. Like Also in that piece, you, you discuss, um, you know, the different options that we can kind of paint on this canvas, so to speak. And, and you say that pluralism is really a dead option, but there's four other live ones. Um, you know, do you have anything to you know, mention about that? Yeah, so the, the phrase universalism has been used in two different ways, and I don't know if this is conscious. I assume it's unconscious because people aren't being critical in, in how they're using the term. There's the idea of universalism as a soteriology. That is that um, universalism is a view of who goes to heaven eventually. And then there's the view of universalism as a theory of reality. That is that all, you know, it's something that looks more like pluralism, that, that all views, all metaphysical views are, at the end of the day, correct. Um, and it seems like nobody who is a Christian can argue for pluralism, for the theory of reality, that, you know, both, um, you know, uh, some sort of monistic faith and, and Islam and, and Christianity and um, some, you know, I don't know, atheism, of a, you know, materialism, that they're all at the end of the day, they're all true. Um, you know, that, that seems quite, well, it, it seems to me quite silly if you say these are, you're actually trying to say this is what's true of reality itself. Um, but universalism is a theory of salvation certainly can be discussed by Christians and has been discussed by Christians. And you're not a heretic for bringing it up because you affirm, if you're a Christian, you are affirming the central creeds. Yeah, the pluralism denies that at the center of reality, you know, is the triune God who's rescuing his creation from sin and death. And and, and as such, you know, that that just simply is off the table. Unless you want to be a pluralist, which is just fine. Go be a pluralist and, um, and even have conversations with Christians. But let's let's at least be careful about, you know, how we describe ourselves. That would be worthwhile. Yeah, I hear what you're saying. So so then one of the views then of, of hell would kind of view um, hell as rehabilitation. Now, is, would that be the other sense of universalism that you're – Well, I think that's – I think that's a helpful phrase for – uh, Rob Bell's view, and for some other people like you know uh, Dr. Robert Perry, he um, you know when when talking about like the evangelical universalist, I think what they're saying about hell is that this is more like a purgatorial state. There will be a judgment. People are going to be sent to a spot where they are going to undergo pains associated with not being rescued by. Jesus Christ, um, and that eventually those pains, those fires of hell will draw them towards repentance, and, the, and that eventually, you know, all will come to, to saving faith. Mm -hmm. um, so that, the, the function of hell, and I think function is really important in discussions of hell. The function of hell for those who are seen as universalists or as rehabilitationists, I think that's a better, more precise term for that. Um, the function of hell ends up being it is a place where recovery takes place or where transformation takes place, where just, I mean, even a severe beating takes place such that somebody says, oh, yeah, I do want to be part of the heavy, heavenly life. Now, we've been talking about. Uh, universalism and rehabilitation and all this, but this isn't actually um, your particular view. Uh, you come mm -hmm. down more on the side of annihilationism. Is that right? I do, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, and I'm sure you've covered this, but I, I think that when hell is described in the Bible, it's generally spoken of as a place of death or of perishing, um, of being destroyed. And so the function of hell, again, is the destruction of a of a human soul of a human being? Hmm. So it may be nice to think of the idea of like hell being a place of rehabilitation where people will come out. But according to 
uh, more of a scriptural view, you think, hell actually is kind of has a finality about it. Is that right? Yeah. Um, yeah, I th- I'm, I, I also am emotionally moved by the picture of hell as rehabilitation. I think it could be true. Um, I don't, I'm not going to throw, you know, stamp my foot down and say it's not possible. Um, I do think that the Bible when, when picturing hell is, is, is really clear that, that the hell is a place uh, in which a judgment takes place and that those who um, have not united themselves to the only life there is will be cast into death because that's the only place for them to go. And that and that ends up being the destruction of the human soul. And I think that just plays out over and over and over in the New Testament and in the Old Testament. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's the only place for them to go. I like what you're saying. That ties back in actually into your book, Everything New. Right. In, in that book, you of course, it's much bigger than just the topic of hell. It's, uh, you kind of have a much bigger picture, a broader thing, what you're doing there. Uh, you know, why don't you just tell for us a little bit about about what you're trying to accomplish, like in that book? Well, the the big idea for me is just picturing here's here's why I, I follow Jesus. Um, this is why I see um, at the Fulcrum Center of Reality that. There is a personality there, and, and that personality consistently identifies itself as Jesus of Nazareth. And um, that's just been my experience. I think there's good reasons for thinking that. Um, the uh, the picture um, that I struggle with in terms of just life in general, when when I was an agnostic, when I wasn't really into the Christian thing anymore, um, the primary problem you look around is, is death and everything is dying and everybody you care about is going to die. Um, and the pain and death that we experience as human beings is, is overwhelming and there needs to be answers to it. Whatever view, whatever philosophy you hold, you have to struggle with death and pain, um, and it seems to me that the Christian answer to these is truly profound and in the in the available options consistently shows itself as the best in my mind. Um, and that is that there there is a God that cares for his world and is rescuing it um, and leading it um, towards restoration. Um, and so the the story that I see unfolding in in the Bible, but specifically in the life uh, miracles teachings, uh, death and resurrection of Jesus, and the giving of the Spirit by Jesus ends up being one in which God has decided he is going to enter our sphere and beginning to reorchestrate um, everything he sees. And so the miracles of Jesus end up being all restorative. You don't see Jesus lifting rocks with his mind power or turning people into frogs you see jesus taking things that are dysfunctional and making them functional again and that ends up being just a powerful picture of god's priorities of taking all those things that are wed to wickedness or that um produce pain and 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 reshaping them and it seems to me that the the language of the new testament is that heaven is breaking into our world right now, and we are invited to be a part of that because God is making everything new. And if you summarize the gospel, in my mind, if you suffer, summarize the gospel just in shorthand, it's it's that. It's that Jesus is Lord. He is the Lord of the cosmos and has the authority to come in and orchestrate everything as he wishes. And that is our great hope that we can be part of that. Because if you are not part of God's rescuing, you're left with a material universe that obviously is going to destroy you and everything you care about. Um, and so the big idea in the book is that it's, it's here's my move from ag- agnosticism towards belief in Christ is that they're simply the, the answers that materialism gives in terms of the future in terms of even the present is it hands you an out of control body in which you're you're determined by your chemically driven thoughts and uh impulses 
And eventually, you are going to die, and the meaning that you create for your life is going to die with you, and everything else around you is going to die. And that's just a it's a it's a repugnant, tragic state of affairs. And it's worth just rejecting it and saying, you know, dear God, is there anything else out there? And it seems to me that when you do ask that question, dear God, is there anything else out there? There is a voice and it's screaming. Yes, of course there is. Come over here. This is where life is. And so that's why that's why I follow Jesus. Mm. Yeah. And then so then so the idea of hell then kind of comes in as you say, like as an, as an anti-creation element, uh, sort of like right. a reversing of God's bringing about of order in this universe. Yeah, I think that there's – so you you may know more about this than I do, but there seems to me that most Christian philosophers actually have embraced the Augustinian view of evil, that evil is not something that's real, that it's anti-creation or that it's it's a privation. It's, a, it's an absence in something that ought to be whole. And I, I mean I think you just – you you play that out. In terms of God has made a good world, there there are pockets of dysfunction in it. And when we talk about sin, we ought to think about these are the things that are creating holes in God's good world. When we think of Satan, it, Satan is the personification of that power at work in our world. When we think about hell, we should think about a metaphysical reality. This is the absence. This is the void. This is where things get tossed that no longer exist. Um, and God is reconciled, you know, in the language of Paul, God's reconciling all things to himself in Christ. And therefore, there is abs the only thing that exists metaphysically must be the absence because all things have been reconciled to Christ. And so this, so hell ends up being a term that signifies death, destruction, complete evaporation. Um, and it seems to me that just plays out in Jesus' parables really smoothly. I mean, just almost, it's, it, it, it's truly amazing to me um, how, you know, I, I don't, I reject the traditional view of hell, um, the eternal conscious torment view of hell. Um, but, I, and I, I, I find it striking how it, it doesn't seem to, to work, um, yeah. when you start thinking philosophically about these things. Yeah. It seems like the traditional view is kind of just like, you know, I don't want to cheapen it or anything, but it's kind of like thrown in at the end as, as maybe a place where all well, these souls have to go somewhere. And, so yeah. we put them here, whereas your view, it seems like hell is more integrated into the entire system of what God is doing with creation, uh, what he's doing here with his his universe. And then hell is just kind of a logical consequence. It's kind yeah. of a necessary consequence of what happens when people within this system don't uh, submit to the will of God. Yeah, I think that's right. And um, if God's create, if God is making everything new and inviting everybody to be part of that there's some who are who are going to hate that and not going to want to be part of it and that's just fine you know they have not chosen to unite themselves to life and so obviously they're going to die and that is so obvious every atheist i know knows that they're going to die and evaporate um if they you know go down that path or if they continue to hold that view um the uh and it seems like that's when, if God removes all evil from his world, that's what it's going to look like. It's going to look like God tossing everything that's dysfunctional into the nothingness, whatever that might look like. Mm. So it seems like the atheist's own view of annihilation uh, actually kind of fits with what the biblical view is in a strange sense, huh? And, and I think that's one of the actually charming things about annihilationism is that if if the traditional view is true then you have this this story this this myth this this idea of well there's a prison somewhere and god's going to throw you there if you don't believe what he you know says about reality or if you don't follow him or however you want to look at at that um with the annihilationist view it's not a secret what's going to happen <laughs> to you when you die, right? It's quite clear. 
And it seems to me like with the New Testament especially, the idea that you might live after you die is a brand new idea for them, you know, in terms of the resurrection uh, being an actual hope. I think in our culture we miss this because in our culture everybody seems to think you're going to live somewhere, you know, in heaven or something after you die. Whereas I think when the New Testament's being written, I don't think that's common at all. I mean, one of the big um, selling points or pushes from the early Christians is that there is going to be a resurrection and you can be part of this. You don't have to go to the grave. Mm. Yeah, so, so, you, so you're around atheists a lot. You talk in the book about, you know, you have a lot of friends who are unbelieving friends in philosophy departments or perhaps uh, in your education and stuff. Uh, what's your sense of their view of hell, of this, of the traditional view? Do you, do you think that the traditional view of hell is is a hindrance for non-believers? Yeah. So, and I'd be curious what your thoughts are on this. When so I watched the debate between Bill Craig and um, Sam Harris recently, and the and obviously when Sam Harris wanted to bring out his best arguments and kind of do a list, here's why you shouldn't be a Christian. The first thing he mentions is hell. Hmm. And there's a reason that it's the first thing he mentions, because people are repulsed by the traditional view of hell. And and it seems to me if one is going to hold to the traditional view of hell, that might be well and good, but you need to show why it is praiseworthy. You need to show um, why God thinks this is the best possible solution to the evil in my world. Hmm. You need to show why God says, you know what? I, I got all kinds of different options here. I'm going to make a world in which half the population will suffer indefinitely for a couple trillion years and then a couple trillion more years and then a couple trillion more. And for most, I mean, for most atheists, it, it just smacks of myth. It smacks of, um, a, a religion trying to control people through fear. Um, it makes Christianity not a, a, a an option for them because it it has entered the realm of the ridiculous. Um, because there's simply you know they they want to say something like, look, a good God would not create that world, and even if that God exists, your God isn't worthy of worship if he is going down that road. Yeah, but with the uh, annihilationist view, it looks like you could say, well. Well, I mean, look, atheists, you're, um, you already believe that the universe is sort of winding down and entropy's hitting things and, and death is ahead of you anyways. And, and it seems like that's a, a sheer fact of reality and it's going to happen. But so now we can focus on the positive aspects of the gospel and the positive aspects of what Jesus is, is doing for us and show them that there is an escape from that, you know, annihilation that certainly faces all of us. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and on two fronts, one you can you can say that side of things is like here is here is a rescue plan. I mean, really, I mean, here is where meaning can be established. Um, death isn't going to necessarily swallow everything. But at the same time, I find one of the real benefits to the annihilationist view is that it says here's what God is doing with with evil and death. He is destroying them, and that is the project. And that, and you hold up hell as the description of what happens to evil and death. They are destroyed, and they're destroyed decisively by a God who judges them um, as not worthy of participation in His new creation. It would could you really celebrate in heaven, knowing that the people, some of the people you care for most, are are in a state of 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 torment at that moment, you know? Um, that see that seems that seems quite silly to me. I mean, it just does. Yeah. Whereas the annihilationist view will have evil kind of fully eradicated from God's kingdom, from God's world, from God's universe. It's a, it will be fully gone, and there won't be any more place of suffering, and you know, anywhere. It'll just God will have led His creation to that sort of sense of polygenesia that you that you talk about uh, right. in the book. 
Yeah, so um, that again, it strikes me as in terms of the the person who's not yet a uh, Christian being able to pitch well that God longs to make all things new for there to be a rebirth. The Paling Ganesia ends up being this this image of of restoration of everything, and that God longs to remove wickedness. And that judgment is really a good thing. It's good to judge child molesters. Um, it's good to judge uh, arms dealers. It's good to to take everything that's dysfunctional and simply say this this isn't connected to life. And God is creating a sphere of life and inviting everybody into that. And now is the time to make that choice. That's a great. I find that that's a really satisfactory pitch and it's one that i believe and it's not one that i came to because my parents made me i mean i think it's really a satisfying answer to a lot of the existential problems that humanity faces mm, that's true yeah and i guess it, it helps us to have a an evangelism that's not just you know scaring people to the cross i suppose <laughs> yeah and then and isn't it the case that christians get a bad name bad reputation because they're doing that and it's time to stop. Because especially when we have such a more of a, a beautiful picture, a, a beautiful story of what God's doing in creation that you've kind of outlined so well in your book to be able to present to people. Yeah. Yep. I think that's right. And then kind of kind of part of the, you know, part of this beautiful picture has to do with how you uh, talk about heaven in the book as well. You know, you kind of critique the. I don't know, I guess the traditional view of, of heaven in a sense of of being somewhat escapist in a lot of people's minds. And, and no secret that uh, viewing heaven as more as a, a place of coming to earth, of God's will being done on earth, of the eternal home of the Christian being on, on earth, rather than kind of escaping to an ethereal realm or whatever is is uh, growing in popularity and in the Christian conscious. And you see on this in your book, too. Uh, I wonder if you would kind of relate that idea of heaven is not an escapism is kind of a foil to this view of hell. Yeah. One of the great things that's happening right now in theology, I see, it seems to me is, is that this idea of new creation is really coming back to the center. Um, and that we aren't being prepared to go somewhere else after we die, but that nearly everything the New Testament talks about has to do with heaven longing to infiltrate our space and swallow it up in health and make it fully alive. And um, my favorite example of this is actually the passage that ends up being most cited by those who want to argue for like a rapture, uh, we're going somewhere else kind of image. And it's from, what is it? It's from First Thessalonians, um, where, you know, Jesus is going to come back with the sound of trumpets and all of us are going to meet him in the air. Um, and, uh, but there's a, there's a, <laughs> there's a classic word in the midst of there. It says like the Lord is going to descend and we are going to meet him in the air. And the direction of Jesus is descending. And it's like we're meeting Jesus out and ushering him into his space. And the, and the image ends up being one that was probably really common in the, the ancient world of a king going out to fight a battle somewhere off away from the city. And then returning to his kingdom. And those who love the king going out to, to welcome him back into the kingdom. Um, and you see some of the medieval uh, Christian allegories, like Robin Hood, picturing this this image of the king, like Richard the Lionheart, going off to fight a war, and that while he's away, uh, bad men rise up and take over the kingdom and begin exploiting its resources for their own gain. And there are some who rebel against the bad men, like Robin Hood. And while the king and while the king is away, they are actually obeying the king by being subversive rebels in the face of these bad men who have taken over. And then when King Richard the Lionheart returns, obviously Robin Hood would be one of the first to run out to greet him as he came back to restore order. And that's the image of 
the Bible, you consistently see God longing to infiltrate our space. And whether that's in the Garden of Eden, in which God is walking in the cool of the day, or whether that's like the pillar of fire and cloud descending, or whether it's like the, the Son of God being with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fire, or whether it's Jesus being incarnated, or whether it's the Holy Spirit um, descending and filling um, the mouths of the early Christians, or whether it's the end of the Bible itself, in which there is a marriage of heaven and earth, and heaven descends, um, you know, in the last couple chapters there, the Revelation, it's consider- that's the movement of God. It's movement of descending into our space, and that is what heaven is. Heaven is the sphere of God's presence, and we aren't being, you know, pulled away from this planet to go there, but that heaven is coming here and the here's the thing that's explosive is that heaven longs to come and fill our space now and that's what the the gift of the holy spirit is it's heaven beginning to fill you and fill your work and fill your your relationships and begin to transform what you are and what you do into a space that is holy and pleasing to Christ right now. And and that becomes, I mean, you want to talk about subversion, that becomes um, the most powerful thing in the world. That is the restoration of our planet occurring, as it were, right now. So it's sort of like pulling that future eschatological reality of heaven kind of into the present. Now. Yeah. And then, and then I guess the same would be true for hell. And it is. And, and isn't it the case that the places that we think our worst, both inside of ourselves and as we look around the world, end up being these places in which the rule of God is obviously absent. And it almost feels like those are the places they're disintegrating, that are falling apart, that are dysfunctional. These might be all, lang- you know, again, language of annihilation um, is just right there on the tip of our tongues if we want to just, you know, talk about the places that are the worst places in our world. I mean, one place you could actually go there with Jesus' teachings end up being the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount and the things that he wants to say about Gehenna, I think are are deeply practical contemporary issues. Uh, practical, I mean, here and now issues, I should say. Get rid of lust. It, if you don't get rid of lust, it's like throwing yourself into a fiery pit of trash. Um, get rid of... of Rage and hate. It's like throwing yourself into a fiery pit of trash. I I think that that even if you don't live in Jerusalem and aren't going to experience the same things that they're going to experience during that generation, um, that the the words of the Sermon on the Mount are still true. Um, And certainly Jesus is speaking about the coming destruction of Jerusalem by the, the Romans, you know, there with the stuff that he's saying at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. But it's still the case that those words are true, that, that you throw yourself into hell by allowing sin to take over your mind um, with lust or greed or uh, wrath. Um, these are these are these are anti-creation forces mm. that love to rip, rip you apart, love to rip all of us apart. Mm. So so these anti-creation forces, um, you know, the sort of. We've been talking about hell as sort of affecting and being with us now, but but ultimately there will be a real eschatological reality, um, a sense in when a real judgment day, a, a day when the annihilation will be complete. Yeah, and, and that's the great, I think that's the great Christian hope. It's the great hope of the Bible is that God will judge, will come, I mean, what's the last, the last, uh, sentence of the Bible, come quickly, Lord Jesus, ends up being just that, like we long for the day when judgment will happen and all the evil will be eliminated and we will live in God's restored world. Um, I watched a a friend of mine just lost her son, a 25-year-old man. Um, She's a 50-year-old woman. And and just the pain associated with that is is really unbelievable. Just how many tears, how much pain is associated with the death of those that we care about. And isn't it just such a great good that that will not, that death does not have the last word, um, that, that God does, and that we look forward to all of the places that we find ourselves internally 
in slavery to um, our appetites, um, to our our self centeredness. Um, all those are going to be stripped away and destroyed. Um, death itself will be destroyed. And that's a, I, j- again, it just seems to me when I look at the landscape of religious traditions in our world, offering solutions to the problem of pain, uh, offering solutions um, to what does it mean to be a human being, the Christian story just consistently jumps, especially when you start talking about new creation. I just I don't think there's any body that's close in terms of just emotional pull for me. I'm just deeply captivated by that story and think that it's the most worthy one out there. Amen. Lord, please do come quickly. But yeah, so we've been talking here with Jeff Cook, uh, the author of Everything New, One Philosopher's Search for a God Worth Believing in, and uh, yeah, Annihilationist, or, or those searching and looking uh, into this doctrine. I Highly recommend it to you if you're looking for kind of a portrait that paints a, a you know in broad strokes the big picture view of what God's doing in creation in the world and and then how hell sort of fits into that logically I I commend this book to you you know in those ways and so Jeff I, I thank you so much for being with us on the show today and uh, and for taking your time to, to talk with me yeah my pleasure Josh thank you for the invitation for sure. Well, I hope you enjoyed the interview. Uh, I'm sure that you'll get to hear more of Josh in the future here at Rethinking Hell. And if you want to find links to Jeff Cook's uh, websites and where you can purchase his book, you can go to RethinkingHell.com and click on Episode 9 where you'll find the show notes to uh, to this episode. Now, some number of episodes back, I read uh, an iTunes review. I had done that a few times before as well. And we've received several since. I'm not going to read all of them that we've received since the last one that I read, you know, so that I can save some to read in future episodes. Uh, But I did want to read two or three of them. One of them is a five-star review by Jonathan D. Green, entitled Rethinking and Reforming Always. He writes, There is a reformation of sorts underway within evangelical Christianity, one that is undeniable and well overdue. This podcast will be an essential tool in propagating a useful, fruitful, and well-measured dialogue to that end, and is aiding nicely thus far in giving a voice to a thoroughly biblical viewpoint like conditionalism or annihilationism. Even if one is a member of the traditionalist camp, it is vitally important that we remain open and willing to engage in conversation regarding just what precisely the scripture does teach regarding the ultimate fate of the unrepentant. I look forward to hearing much more from Chris and the fine folks at Rethinking Hell. <laughs> well, thanks so much, Jonathan. We really appreciate that. Uh, another five-star review comes from J.R. Hannon, and it's entitled, Atheists Point Out That Christians Believe Sinners Burn Forever and Ever. He writes, I have dealt with atheists, and one of the main reasons they do not believe in God is the belief that souls burn forever and ever in hell. They say that is not fair, and I agree with them. God is fair and just and would not burn someone forever and ever, and I believe your website shows that biblically very well. I am glad for your podcast, and it is presented very well with the scriptures. Good work. Well, thank you, uh, J.R. Hannon. Uh, as if you've listened to my debates on the topic, you'll know that I'm not somebody who thinks that the traditional view of hell is unjust, but many conditionalists do, and um, I'm glad that uh, you find that our biblical presentation backs up the uh, what you believe to be just. Uh, now we actually have received a negative comment, which is um, uh, we always appreciate, we enjoy the comments. Blessed John gives us a one-star review entitling it, Jesus came to warn and save all from hell. Uh, Blessed John writes, do you not know that Jesus spoke more about hell than heaven? He came to warn and save all who would listen about the awful truth of an everlasting separation from God in hell. That is how severe sin really is before a holy God. You call yourself Christians, yet deny the reality of suffering in hell, as well as Satan not suffering for eternity. You may water down the truth, but you will never change it as you promote a lie from the pit of hell yourselves. Be very careful, for you are on a very slippery slope, a doctrine of demons. When we all stand before our Creator, none will be without excuse, no, not one. I pray for the souls of those promoting this lie and causing many to stumble. Their blood will be on your hands. Repent of your lows before it is too late. Well, John, I appreciate the comment. I, I take it seriously. I take the um, uh, the uh, 
admonition very seriously. Uh, but if you've listened to any of our podcast episodes, if you've read anything that we've written, we're deeply committed to what the scripture says about hell. Um, we don't deny the reality of suffering in hell. We think that there will be suffering, as, or at least many of us do, there will be suffering as part of the uh, final execution of the risen wicked, which we think is very clearly taught in scripture. Uh, if we're wrong about that, and if we mislead anybody unintentionally, then I certainly pray that God will be uh, f you know, forgiving and merciful toward us. Uh, but fortunately, I think that uh, the traditional view of hell has a much bigger challenge of demonstrating that it's the biblical view of final punishment. So I would encourage you to check out what we've uh, published in the podcast and we published on the blog. For the rest of you, we would really encourage you to uh, leave us iTunes reviews if you're so inclined. We definitely appreciate four and five star reviews, but we welcome you know lower star reviews as well and we take your feedback seriously. That's all we've got for today. Be sure to check out the blog and podcast at RethinkingHell.com and be sure to follow us at Twitter at RethinkingHell. And stay tuned for the next episode of the Rethinking Hell podcast, which will be an interview with traditionalist Douglas Wilson. Should be pretty interesting. Until then, 